Therefore, they do not give you a prediction of what the world will be like. They give you a projection of what it might be like. But that might is one might chosen out of literally billions of alternative mites, which could equally well be the case. So the computer models, and the public does not understand this, do not predict future climate. What they do is they project a possible future climate. And because people are so concerned about global warming, including lots of the people that do the models, it is no surprise that lots of the models are organised in such a way that they project future warming. But surely our political leaders should have picked up on, on, on this. Uh, they're supposed to be um, intelligent people. Well, well, I'm sure they're very intelligent, Terry, but I'm not sure they should be expected to pick up. I mean, after all, every year they ask the Treasury to model the economy for the next year, and the Treasury duly does so, and the, the Treasury uses it in the budget, and then every year the numbers which actually eventuate are completely different to the ones that were projected, not predicted, by the Treasury. It is the nature of computer modelling that it's a game-playing exercise. It's to understand things. It's not about making predictions. You can't predict the budget exactly. You can't predict climate exactly. But here we are in New Zealand, uh, just 10 weeks away from, from having a, a new tax uh, or virtual tax uh, put on us uh, as, a, as a because of these models. Well, I have in public in New Zealand and Australia many times asked the question, how many degrees of cooling are we going to get for the amount of carbon dioxide that is not going to be emitted because of this extra tax? And I have yet to have a politician answer that question. The answer is, in fact, in thousands of a degree. It will be unmeasurable. New Zealand could stop its entire industrial economy and transport economy tomorrow, could cut all carbon dioxide emissions. The effect on climate would be unmeasurable. Now, you mentioned the third reality, socio-political reality, what do you mean by that? Well, of course, that's where I start getting uncomfortable and shifting in the chair because I'm a scientist and it's not my business to tell people about the socio-political situation. But the reality is that uh, climate change, or more strictly global warming, ceased to be a scientific issue at least 10 years ago and has now become a political issue of the highest order. And when you look at the way the politics of that is being handled, it's a complex um, issue, but the big green non-governmental organisations are part of it on the world scale. And in individual countries such as New Zealand, the green political parties are part of it. Uh, and people's fears have been aroused to the point that all major political parties, be they nomin nominally left-wing or nominally right-wing, are forced or have been forced by public opinion to acknowledge this threat. So the socio-political reality is that if you look at the science, as I said earlier, the scientific reality, and it says there's no danger of out of control global warming at the moment. If anything, there's a danger of cooling. It's not easy for a politician to get up and even say that because they will be buried in criticism. So, the so And that's the socio-political reality, that it's very difficult for governments to handle because you can't actually have an intelligent discussion about the science without getting enveloped with the politics of the special interest groups. Do you think the news media has been fair to its uh, reading and viewing public in the way it has uh, portrayed this whole climate change stroke global warming debate? There are some honourable exceptions to what I'm going to say, and what I'm going to say is no, the news media in general have handled this issue very badly. There are, however, a number of newspapers internationally uh, which have presented in a balanced fashion uh, both sides of the story. The Wall Street Journal is one of the outstanding ones. The British uh, Telegraph and Sunday Telegraph is a second, and the Australian Rupert Murdoch's paper in Australia is a third. Uh, that's in the printed media. If you look in the television and radio media, it's very, very hard to find any station which is not basically um, pushing the global warming barrow. Uh, there is a lack of intelligent balanced commentary on this issue in the media, yes. So where do we go from here? Well, I think we have to acknowledge the socio-political reality. And the socio-political reality is that people want something done about climate change. Now, it turns out New Zealand has world leadership in some things, and one of the things that, well, it used to have world leadership in was rugby union, I believe. There's a new kid on the block called the Reds from Queensland, where I live, that is looking it might shake things up a bit this year. But So perhaps rugby union is no longer quite what it was. But there's an area of science where New Zealand has world leadership and is widely admired for. And it's this. It, it's called Geonet. 
and, and it's an agency run. It's not very well known in the public eye in, in New Zealand. It's an agency run jointly by NIWA and uh, Institute of Geological Sciences, two government uh, crown research institutes. And what NIWA does is it monitors the natural hazards of the country and it advises the public and government about when there's an impending uh, problem, and impending hazard, and uh, gives advice on how to recover from it. Uh, NIWA and uh, IGNS have excellent scientists that understand basically what causes earthquakes, what causes volcanic eruptions, what causes storms. All of those things come under the ambit of GeoNet. Now, it is not a preventative or a mitigating agency. And the reason is, you can't find anybody, not even a politician, that will offer to stop a volcanic eruption, or to stop sea level change, or to stop an earthquake. The idea is absurd. Well, trying to stop climate change is just as absurd. So, all these natural hazards you have to deal with by preparing for them and reacting to them when they happen, and then helping the people who are affected through no fault of their own in a bad way. GeoNet, with a very small amount of modification, could easily advise the government on adapting to future climate change. And that is the path for the future, which many commentators, not just me, are suggesting. It is not about preventing climate change. Indeed, the idea is silly. It is about being prepared for the natural climate changes that will be imposed on us. They will include warmings, they will include coolings, and they will include spectacular storm events like the Wahini storm in Wellington where we are today. All of those things. It's government's sovereign duty to protect its citizenry to the degree it can against those events. So the way forward, the sensible, practical policy solution is to prepare for future climate change. And one way that could be done is by charging GeoNet, for example, with that responsibility as well as, well as the short-term storm responsibility it has at the moment. Well, what effect will imposing uh, an ETS charge, that's a charge for emissions of uh, carbon dioxide by humans and animals, what effect is that going to have in stopping all of us? Well, it will have a dramatic effect in making people of green disposition feel good about themselves. That's its main function. It's a guilt reduction thing. It, it will do nothing for climate. So, how will ETS affect the average Kiwi household? Well, that's a, a good question to the degree that I've been going around asking that myself for the last uh, year or more. I can't get a politician or a scientist advising a politician in either Australia or New Zealand to answer that question. As far as the public's concerned, that's what they want to know. They don't mind paying a tax, provided they see they get something back for the tax. We pay taxes, we get hospitals, we get schools, that's fine. So now we're being told, we pay this extra tax on carbon dioxide, what are we going to get back? And the answer is, well, you're going to do your bit towards stopping global warming. You're going to do what? You're going to do your, because you're going to emit less carbon dioxide. Oh, am I? Well, yes, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. So if we emit collectively a little bit less, then there will be a little bit of a warming that won't happen, that otherwise would have happened. So given that New Zealand produces 0.2%, I think it is, of all the world's greenhouse gases, and supposing we cut back by 5% or 10% or 20%, number doesn't really matter, how much cooling at a global level is not able to be imputed to that? And I say you can't get a government scientist to tell you the answer. The reason is you can only answer it by using a computer model, and the computer models tell you it will be unmeasurable. It is of the order of one one thousandth to one ten thousandth of a degree of warming averted. So that's what you're going to get back for the taxes you're going to pay. How much tax are you going to pay depends entirely on the level at which the uh, carbon dioxide is taxed. But at the sorts of levels they're talking about, 15, 20, 30 dollars per ton, it's of the order of two to three thousand dollars per family per year. So that's the deal. Two to three thousand dollars per family per year extra tax. In return, you get an unmeasurable theoretical reduction of global warming. 